50 years ago, a farmer on Scotland's Orkney Island of South Ronaldsey was digging in a mound close to cliff tops when he uncovered an entrance into a dark subterranean chamber. What he found staring back at him was 30 human skulls. When the tomb was excavated, the remains of a staggering 342 people were found. But not one of them was a single complete skeleton. Someone or something had scattered the remains around the tomb. Trying to figure out what, Ronald Hutton enters the burial chamber. Getting into this tomb is difficult, dirty, but uncomfortable, and that's the way it was designed. You have to crawl, you have to bow your head in humility and enter a different world. Once inside, the tomb opens out into a narrow room with a large chamber at each end and smaller side chambers down at floor level. Piles of assorted bones and rows of skulls were found here. Ronald believes it's evidence that the pagans often returned to handle the bones of their ancestors. Probably people would have brought a light, but it seems that they might not have done so, that have collided with the dead in the dark, and at best, that have had this eerie glow revealing one skull, one long bone after another. And you're making contact with the dead very intimately, very physically, and almost literally on those as being rubbed in death. But why would the local people feel such a compelling need to be close to their dead? The answer appears to lie in the young age at which so many died. Studies of the bones have revealed that very few of the dead were over 25. Most of the people in this population would be children and adolescents. They'd be desperately reliant upon oral tradition, whispers, tales of what had happened before, to have any sense of continuity, because actual experience lived history for the people in this tomb is very, very short indeed, which means the power of the dead is all the greater. The lack of complete bodies means that the skeletons may have been broken apart and stripped of their flesh before being brought into the tomb. Clues to how this might have been done lie among the human remains, sea eagle skulls and talons. It seems likely that eagles were an integral part of the pagan death rituals that took place here. Now this could be that when the bodies were laid out after death, they were picked clean by these huge birds. Certainly, the bones were clean when they were brought into the tomb. And this is so that the bones can be handled, can be used in ceremonies, in rituals. Or it could even be the eagle as the symbol of the entire community down here on this island. They are the people of the eagle. Today, this burial place is known as the Tomb of the Eagles, but when it was built, it was probably as much a temple as a grave. One of our problems in studying the Neolithic is what we call these places. We call them tombs, but in the modern sense, that has to be wrong, because they are the temples of the time, they are the holy places. And it could be that the dead themselves were transmitters. So you use their bones, rather like uh, mobile phones, to contact the goddesses and the gods. And only through the dead can you gain access to the other world. We can now rebuild the Tomb of the Eagles as it was when pagan tribesmen came here to commune with their dead. Divided into three sections by upright flagstones built into the walls, at either end of the tomb were compartments, one of which was full of human bones. The chambers in the western end of the tomb held dozens of skulls and still more lined the walls beside piles of bones. And placed among the human remains were the bones and skulls of sea eagles. The only way in or out of the tomb was through the long, narrow entranceway. Back to the world of the living. And it's so bright. But the Tomb of the Eagles is not the only example of a pagan burial site in the Orkney Islands. 20 miles north is a place which holds yet more secrets about the death rites and religion of the pagan islanders. The magnificent sandstone tomb of Mays Howe. Archaeologist Erica Goodman investigates. This place is amazing. 
And one of the things that really strikes me to begin with is just how fine the masonry is. Remember at Scarabray, it was quite coarse. It was just little slabs of stone straight off the beach. You know, some of them were even rounded beach pebbles. But here, here it's all carved. You can see the masonry marks where they're actually carving this into a nice, neat block. Maze Howe is the largest tomb on Orkney. Built some 5,000 years ago, it's made of huge Orkney flagstones, some weighing an incredible 30 tons. Approximately 15 feet square with smaller side chambers in the middle of the walls to the left, right, and rear of the tomb, its floor plan mirrors the houses of Skara Bray. This is about a similar sort of size and shape to the houses at Scarabray. And not only that, but when you walk into the, into the tomb here, there's a focal point here, right where the dresser would have been in the house. Also, you've got these chambers to either side in the same place as the bed has been in the house at Scarabray. Of course, the one thing that's missing is the fireplace. The similarities between the tomb of Maze Howe and the houses of Scarabray are further evidence that the pagans of Orkney believed in a special closeness between the world of the dead and the world of the living. Another central aspect of pagan religion was the cycle of the seasons. Pagan means country dweller, and their dependence on the land meant that pagans were very aware of their place in the natural world. They attributed special significance to turning points in the seasons. They attached great importance to the summer and winter solstices, when the longest and shortest days of the year occur, as well as to the spring and fall equinoxes, the two days of the year when day and night are of equal length. Evidence of this can be seen in the tomb at Mays Howe. It is deliberately designed to mark one of these key seasonal events. On midwinter day, which is the winter solstice, the sunlight comes straight down this passageway and it shines on the back of the tomb. The Neolithic engineers designed this on purpose in order to capture the moment of the winter solstice. And that's because in pagan thinking, the solstices are very important. For the pagans, midwinter was the time of the dead the season when fields were barren and no crops grew. The winter solstice marks the end of winter. By bringing its light into the tomb, the pagans were seeking the help of the ancestors, hoping to ensure the return of spring. But to capture the light of the midwinter sun, the builders of Maze Howe needed to perfectly align the entrance tunnel of the tomb. The four large pillars at the corners of the chamber hold a clue. The pillars are an enigma. They offer no structural support to the tomb, suggesting their purpose may lie in their close resemblance to standing stones. Local archaeologist Martin Carruthers believes that the four stones could be part of a ring of standing stones that once stood outside the tomb. It may well be that there's a series, or have been a series of stones here, present as a circle prior to the construction of the tomb, and it may even be that those pillar stones you saw with inside the chamber originated out here in a stone circle and were then incorporated into the, the later tomb. Around the outside of Maze Howe, archaeologists have discovered holes that probably once housed standing stones. It seems likely that the four stones now inside the tomb were once at the center of a circle of standing stones and lined up the ring with the winter solstice. The tomb was then built around the four stones, the entrance tunnel perfectly aligned with the last rays of the setting sun. Over time, the ring of stones disappeared, and all that remained was the tomb itself. It's clear that communing with the dead was an essential part of pagan life and their death rituals are the basis for a striking new theory about the lost world of the most mystifying of all pagan monuments, Stonehenge.